Today we are using Linux. What's up guys, my name is The Cherno. Welcome back to the Code Review series, the series in which you guys just email me code and I, I take a look at it. Today, as I mentioned, we are on Linux. Don't ask me why I decided this would be a good idea. After spending like two hours recompiling the kernel for the fifth time, I think we finally have a build of Linux running that can run this program that someone sent me. In my quest for diversity when it comes to these code review videos, I mean, last time we did like a university assignment, I'll have that linked up there, but in my quest to be a little bit, you know, different, I've decided that we're not even going to be looking at C++ code today. It's going to be C, C99 to be precise. And we're not going to be looking at it on Windows. We're going to be looking at it on Linux. Now, Windows is kind of my 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 development specialty platform, if that makes sense. Like 90% of the development I've done in my life has been on Windows and for like Windows and other platforms. But these days, especially, I'm kind of on Windows targeting Windows. So this is... Uh, this is, this is going to be interesting. Back when I worked at EA, a lot of my time was spent developing a mobile engine. So Android and iOS development. So I am pretty familiar with like the kind of Linux -y libraries and stuff like that. But that being said, it was a terrible experience developing for Android and it has been a very long time. So this is going to be a, a bundle of joy, this project. It actually is quite interesting. I mean, let's take a look at the actual uh, email that I got. So this was sent to me by Pablo, who does not value anonymity, it seems. This is a voxel renderer that mimics the old Comanche engine that was popular in Nova Logic in the 90s. D do I look old to you? I have no idea what that is. Ah, okay. Right, maximum overkill 1992. That's kind of cool. So I guess all of this terrain is like a kind of a voxel algorithm situation. Can you please share your opinion on this piece of code? It's a voxel engine implementation with multiple threads. The most relevant insights I'd like to hear from you are overall program structure, use of threads, um, cache the friendliness of the solution. Does that mean like how cache friendly it is or I'm supposed to ca cache the friendliness of the... Okay, I'm just gonna assume he's talking about the CPU cache. Key functions are, okay, whatever, we'll, we'll discover that for ourselves. To build and run should be enough to run. Okay, here is the URL. I will have this linked in the description below as always, so you guys can take a look at it. Be sure to be in the multi-thread branch. It looks like the multi-thread branch is the default anyway. So yeah, I mean, this is a screenshot of what it looks like. Pretty cool. I haven't really taken a look at anything like this yet, so I'm actually kind of excited. He did mention that it's got no dependencies, I guess. Uh, although here it's dependent on GLFW, but that's okay. I think it's going to be pretty amazing to take a look at this and uh, see what we can kind of discover in the source code and see if there are any kind of tips that I can provide as well. But first, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. So for those of you who don't know, Skillshare is an amazing online learning community where millions of creative and curious people from all around the world can come together into one place, into one awesome community to learn pretty much any new skill you can think of. Like literally anything that you are interested in that you want to learn more about, Skillshare probably has a class for it. Whether you are interested in like creative topics like photography, videography, illustration, stuff like that. Or you're more interested in like business productivity, how to like run a YouTube channel and how to make good YouTube videos, stuff like that. Skillshare has got you covered. My single most favorite feature about Skillshare is the fact that the videos are just so concise. They're so, they don't have fluff to them. They're really to the point and they, they're they not very long. They don't need to be very long. They're really kind of digestible because they're just so well made that I mean, I could probably benefit from that, let's be honest. But for a limited time, Skillshare is also giving the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description below a one month free trial of Skillshare Premium. So for free, you can take a look at Skillshare's entire catalog of videos and see if there are any classes that you are interested in. Huge thank you to Skillshare as always for sponsoring this video. Let's move on and take a look at this voxel space engine. Okay, so I've cloned the repository, you're looking at it. There's an assets, a libs, a source folder, all of this stuff. Now this uses make, which is pretty standard on Linux. I've also opened up a terminal to this directory. Now outside of this video, just to not bore everyone, I've also installed, just using apt-get install, glfw, and also the audio library that's being used by this repository. It's this uh, so loud thing. So I've installed that on the actual like Linux computer so that I don't have to worry about actually downloading it for this repository specifically. The beauty of Linux is the package managers. I mean, I have to give them that. So now we should just do make and it should just work, which is pretty exciting. And it looks like it 
has in fact worked. So let's take a look at what's happened. There's a bin folder. There's a bunch of files in here, which are presumably the uh, assets that are being used. And there's a binary file. So let's go ahead and get into that bin folder and try and run that binary file. And we get an error, error opening file. Okay, so two files, I guess the shaders probably tried to be open, they didn't work. I swear if someone sends me another project that doesn't work. Okay, so it looks like we are gonna have to fix this. Let's go ahead and open this up in Visual Studio Code and take a look at presumably some kind of shader file that couldn't be loaded. Now you guys can watch how I quickly fix code that I receive. Um, okay, so assets shade. Okay, well, actually, if we go back to this, you can see that there is no assets folder. So what if we uh, move everything into an assets folder? Let's just quickly do this. We'll move literally everything except that also into here. Let's go back to this and uh, see if we can run it. Okay, different error. Syntax error, unexpected explanation mark inside the shader code. I should probably just fast forward through this, but I'm not going to so that you can also feel the pain I'm going through. Well, what is this explanation mark in the shader? What's going on? Where are the shaders? Let's uh, let's go to the shaders. So assets, shaders. That looks pretty standard, pretty good. Should probably make the font size a bit larger. Okay, so this vertex shader looks pretty good to me. I certainly don't see any exclamation marks, neither do I see them here. So I don't know what that error is all about. Shader.c. Okay, let's, let's see if we can print the shader code that we're actually like getting. Okay, so we're reading it here, shader code. Let's just go ahead and uh, right before we compile it, let's just print it to see if we're actually reading the file properly. Because it does look like we're it does look like we're reading the file properly. So I don't know why this specifically isn't working. So let's go back. Make is that gonna remove my assets directory? I hope not. No. Okay. So we'll run it again. Here's the shader code. Ah. Okay. Look. Look at all this. Okay, so it looks like someone has probably forgotten a null termination character. So let's take a look at this. Love the go-tos, um, <laughs> but it's C, so I'll forgive you, maybe. So uh, shader code, uh, we read shader code. Yeah, okay, so this is obviously not going to read to the plus one character, which you shouldn't assume is zero. So there is no null termination character. So let's just go ahead and quickly chuck that in there. And now make and main. All right, it's running. Good. Looks pretty cool, actually. So this is, I guess, some kind of like, okay, it's cycling through all of the different uh, levels here. This this is pretty cool. I like taking I like taking a look at stuff like this. Now, since he mentioned that this is uh, obviously something that I guess is emulating some really old MS DOS uh, engine, uh, I'm assuming that none of this is actually rendered in 3D space. I think it's probably all rendered to some kind of texture and that's all he's using OpenGL for just to display the texture. Um, it's running at 120 FPS, which also implies that uh, it's probably just like software rasterizing essentially. So let's let's actually dive in and take a look at the code. Oh, escape worked, that's nice. So the actual kind of layout uh, seems pretty uh, simple here. We've got a source folder, which has all of the kind of main stuff in it. He's got a pretty nice main function. Again, this is C. So I have to remember that this is C and there are certain things that we have to do, like write void here. I don't know if that's standard C99 kind of code. I have written very little actual C code that is compiled with a C compiler, not a C++ compiler in my life. So I don't even know what is permissible and what is not. But um, we're going to assume that obviously this is, uh, you have to write void here. Okay, so program this equals program create. So program is some kind of struct which we find in program.h. Let's quickly take a look at that. So in general, I like the kind of, um, the, the way that the main function is really clean and we just kind of create the program, which probably initializes some variables, maybe sets up the window, stuff like that. We have a main loop that we call, which probably has like a while loop in there that runs until the window is closed. And then finally we have a destroy to kind of just destroy everything uh, and free all of the memory, which, you know, is questionably like usable. And then he's using this as the kind of variable name because of course this isn't a keyword in C because there are no classes. So uh, that's kind of nice as well. It kind of almost makes me makes me, it tricks me as like a C++ or really as any object oriented programmer, I think. In C Sharp and Java, it's also like, this is also a keyword that refers to the current class instance. So anyway, let's go into program create. Um, and actually I wanna take a look at program.h. So where would that be? Program.h. 
Okay, we've got some nice uh, header guards here. Old school header guards. Love this stuff. Um, <laughs> map type. Oh, got you got a capital Y there, bro. I'm sorry, that's not gonna fly. Um, and then we have uh, okay, color map name is map count. So what is map count? Okay, map count is just the last name I'm here, so it's gonna be the amount of these one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six of them. Okay, so you got color maps and height maps. So if we actually go to the assets for a minute, this might help us decipher this. So we have like what looks like are these color maps, but then we have height maps as well. So the color map just determines like I guess the color of each voxel. So each pixel becomes like a voxel. It's not really a voxel. It's just that it's at a certain height, like, and all of this, like all of this kind of depth and height and these kinds of words, like they're all just, they all just get fed into a mathematical algorithm that actually determines where they are in 2D space anyway, because of course, at the end of the day, we're simply rendering a texture that we display on our screen. So um, it's important to kind of, I think it's important to like, if you're actually curious as to how these algorithms work and how we're able to kind of project all of this in 3D space, don't forget that at the end of the day, you end up with a 2D coordinate of where to place a pixel and of what color. So don't get too kind of carried away with this. So again, we have like a color map, which I guess determines all of this. Know that the shadows are actually kind of baked into these maps. So those shadows that we saw are not really, they're not actually calculated. I actually thought they were. Um, they're not actually calculated. It turns out they're actually encoded into the color map, but then the height map, which will line up with this color map, you can actually see here that you can still see those rivers and they're in the exact same place here. This height map just determines how high things are. So how high is each pixel here that we render as a voxel in 3D space? Well, in, in 3D space, right? So we have the black, which is a lower value, like zero, which is probably like the base. And that's why we have these rivers here. But then as we get higher, the value increases, which kind of makes it go more towards white and it becomes lighter here. So these, these pixels are of a higher value than these pixels because they're brighter, which means that they will be higher conceptually. So that's kind of how these two maps work, which is kind of interesting. And again, I have never looked into engines like this before. Uh, in the 90s, I was busy like learning to walk and talk and do that kind of stuff. So I definitely wasn't playing these games <laughs> and I definitely wasn't studying the engines. Um, so I love looking at this stuff, honestly, because it's, it's kind of cool. It's a blast from the past. Anyway, back to where we were inside programs. Let's go Let's go to the C file and actually kind of take a look at this. Again, I could spend hours looking at this. I'm sure you guys don't want to sit through that. Um, although if you do, let me know. Uh, so let's just go in to program create and see what's up. So it looks like we are high map names and stuff. So we're copy, So we're doing a little string copy. We're copying that into this array. That is fine uh, to do it that way, I guess. Um, again, C, you know, C is always fun. I'm not sure why these even have to go here. I guess they get loaded at some kind of, yeah, Sprite Create probably loads them using an array. So this kind of just sets up that array. Uh, I don't really see why you couldn't have just like assigned these const char pointers to the, uh, to what is presumably, yeah. Oh, oh right. Okay. Because it's a pre-allocated buffer of 50, but they're const chars. You're not going to modify them, are you? Because if they're const char pointers, they're stored in read-only memory, which means you can always you, you can obviously point to them, and they're just in a place in the binary. So there's no actual memory that needs to be uh, like accessible during runtime. And by accessible during runtime, I don't mean accessible, because obviously we can read the read-only memory. We just can't really write to it, or at least we're not supposed to. Uh, so like if you were to allocate like like a, a good example is like the shader code that we load during runtime. That needs to be in a kind of dynamic place because we don't know what the data is before we start running. Whereas this stuff, since these strings are literally stored here, they are just stored in the read-only section, which means that instead of copying them into another place now, which has a buffer that is, I need to double click on these files so they stay open. Um, instead of doing that, which goes into a buffer that is like 50 characters at the most, right? Uh, we don't have to do any of that. We can just store const char pointers and not worry about stack memory allocation, which happens here. So I'm not sure why it's done this way. I probably wouldn't do it this way. These are clearly fixed strings anyway, but whatever. So we create the graphics. I'm not going to dive into the graphics creation too much because I don't think that's the point of this. Uh, and then we, oh, there's, there's sound. I didn't even hear any sound. Um, anyway, and then we go through all the maps and we do sprite create. So what is sprite create? Let me just, uh, I'll just control. Shift F that. So here's Sprite create in Sprite that, uh, okay, uses STB image to actually load the image data. And then we return 
this, which is Sprite, which just contains the image data. Okay, cool. So we allocate a buffer. Well, SCBI will do that actually, uh, which will contain um, our image. So we just create the images basically. Now we've got them inside height maps and color maps. And then we set some other variables again to this, which is our program, which we then kind of copy back to main dot C uh, and then we pass into program main loop. So, you know, this is kind of, uh, I guess, like a structure. I'm not a huge fan of this because we are kind of creating this program object, which we then return and then pass into everywhere. Passing variables around is very common in C style programming. I'm honestly not even sure why they like to do it this way. I would have just stored this in global memory in some kind of structure. Um, so that we could just kind of access it everywhere without having to pass it in everywhere. Again, it is a pretty small program, so I think that's not that big of a deal, but like structurally, that's probably something I would have done. Uh, and then obviously passing it by value like that is also not great because we're kind of copying all of these variables around for no reason. So because um, we don't have references in C, you would use a pointer uh, and then actually pass it in like that. And that would just be something that would be a little bit better. Um, again, you know, not a huge deal. We're not calling main loop repeatedly. We're not copying masses amount of data repeatedly and doing like heap allocations through copy constructors because there's none of that here. But it's still something that I probably would do just as a habit. Okay, and then we have pthread info pthreads and we have these pthread counts. So we have, um, he did mention this was multi-threaded, of course. We have seven threads, it looks like. And these seven threads, so I'm probably gonna focus in on the threads in this video because we haven't really talked about multi-threading before too much in this code review series. And I, you know, how long have I been recording for? This video is probably way too long already. I always, <laughs> these videos always end up being so long. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm just gonna focus in on that aspect of things um, and then we'll kind of brush everything else aside. So what do we do here? So we create seven threads with pthread info. What is pthread info? Uh, let me try and find that. That might be like in the header file. Uh, what is that program.h? Uh, okay, here's pthread info. So we have a, an actual pthread, which is just like a Unix kind of Linuxy style uh, uh, thread. It's, I guess, the equivalent of whatever Win32 threads would be, which I don't know. I mean, in C++, you would use SCD thread, and then behind the scenes, it would it would probably be a P thread on like POSIX platforms. But anyway, so we have the actual thread, right? I wouldn't probably call it handler, but we have the actual kind of thread. Um, and then we have start column and column. Oh yeah, I assume this is just for image data. So what this is, is probably a struct of data that is going to be local to a particular thread. Um, so it looks like the way that he's probably uh, you know, sharing data between threads is he's not really sharing data between threads. Every thread has its own kind of local struct of, of data and it probably gets dispatched to do a particular task. Now, the way that I assume this is working is he's probably, and I haven't looked at the code yet, so this is just a guess, but I assume he's got regions of the image that he's processing from these individual threads. So maybe like a little uh, kind of uh, square that like a tile that is going to be kind of each thread is going to be, but there's seven threads that doesn't really work with tiles. Anyway, we'll see. Um, and then each thread can kind of just focus in on just one region of the image. And that way they're never working on the same, the same kind of image, the same portion of the image, the same memory at the same time. So there's no real kind of need to synchronize those threads, which is good because as soon as you have things like spin locks and various other synchronization, like weightings behaviors, then obviously they're kind of bottlenecks for slowing down multi-threaded uh, programming. Okay. So uh, yeah, so this is basically just us kind of uh, setting that up, that up. We actually allocate a bunch of, um, I guess, color data here, which is going to probably be the destination. So image data is destructive image data, which let's see if we can quickly find that. Here we go. So image data dot H. So we have color, a point, a, an unsigned point, a float point that's actually a double, and uh, this struct of image data, which I guess has a size, which are two ints, uh, a buffer size, an element size, and then the color pointer data, which is probably the destination. So that's actually kind of the image that we're creating that we then later display on the screen. So that's our rendering target, basically, like a frame buffer. Um, and then, uh, okay, sure, okay, okay. So we go through the image data size, which image data size, that's the whole image, I think. Y and then next divided by P3. Oh, okay. Okay, so it looks like he split it up into columns. Um, and that would explain why there's a start column and an end column. So he's probably rendering seven columns 
and and they're kind of each thread is just focusing on its column that it's rendering. So the the image is split into seven columns, and then each thread is rendering a column of the image. Okay, that's interesting. Now he did um, ask me to talk about the CPU cache a bit, so I will mention immediately that this. This kind of already doesn't sit well with me. I don't know how the algorithm works whatsoever. Maybe it has to be like this, but you almost never want to deal with columns. Going down columns is always, almost always worse than going across rows, right? Because assuming the way he's storing this image is, uh, you know, and the way that I guess OpenGL will expect it when it's done anyway, is the fact that like zero, zero is probably like the bottom left or the top left, probably usually the bottom left. And then like, the memory kind of advances, like as the pixels advance in them in their memory position, they're going horizontally. So that's kind of friendly in terms of like the CPU cache, because as you're kind of looping through that that rendering that you're doing, you're you're kind of uh, working on memory that is contiguous. It's kind of right next to each other, and that's a lot more cache friendly than if you were, for example, going down rows. So I'm not I'm not sure if you're actually doing that, but if you are that's probably a big performance boost that you'd get if you were doing it horizontally rather than vertically. Um, but again, I don't know how the algorithm works. Maybe it has to go vertically. Maybe there's, I don't know, maybe it has to be like that because I did see kind of a lot of vertical lines in that image. So it might just be the way it has to be. Okay, there's a demo mode, which we can turn off, I guess. Uh, if demo mode, then it just moves the camera around by itself. Oh, otherwise we have some keys here. So scale X, distance, so F3, F4. Scale X. Okay, so we can change the scale. I'm just going to see if we can actually do this. So left, right, we'll move the camera position. I and A. So A and D is the looking angle. I and O is the height. Up and down is the camera position. Left and right is also the camera position. X. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn demo mode off. Uh, and then let's go ahead and, whoops, let's make it again. And then I'll just do bin slash main dot bin. Ooh, cool. Okay. Yeah, so see, like, the way that it's, like, there are a lot of, I don't like that it's, like, shimmering. <laughs> but there are, it looks like it's just made up of vertical lines of color. So I, maybe the algorithm has to be like that. We can rotate, which looks absolutely awful, <laughs> awful with all the shimmering. It looks fine when it stops, but for some reason when it's moving, it's, it's a bit weird. And then what was it? F1, F2 for, whoa, that... That's trippy. So that's playing with like the perspective, which is where you really start to see that it's actually a 2D image um, in case there was ever any doubt. And then, oh, okay. So this is like the draw distance, which increases the FPS if we make it shorter. Okay. And what else was there? I and O and then D and A was just to rotate. I think that's it. Cool. Right. Oh, what did I press? K. K and L. Okay, to cycle through the different maps. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, this is really nice. Let's take a look at the actual rendering code. So this is all just setting up like camera stuff. I'm not going to bother with that. Um, okay, so here's... Okay, so this is the main loop, right? Yeah, while... So this is inside the main loop. So when we get past all of this kind of input handling stuff, the first thing we do is create a whole bunch of threads. Okay, that's the first thing I want to tell you is, is not ideal. You shouldn't be creating threads every like frame. Um, what you should use is either a thread pool or in this case, since you actually have seven regions on the screen that you're rendering, just create the threads as part of your program create function. And that's it. Like you don't have to, you can just keep them running, right? So you can set up like a while loop inside the threads that is actually constantly rendering and then some basic synchronization to make sure that everything's done and kind of like what you're doing here. You're waiting for the thread to finish execution. And then you're um, at that point, you're drawing everything else. So each thread has to finish its uh, execution. And then I guess you're doing sprite draw and then you're moving on. So you're blocking the main thread to make sure that all the threads are done. And then once they're done, you're moving on. That's fine. But again, because it's like, you're creating threads like this isn't this isn't very cheap. So I would definitely do something like that. If you really like the kind of you don't want to have like each thread be its own constantly running thread with synchronization, because that I will admit that will make it slightly more complex than this kind of threading model. But um, just use a thread pool, right? So you have a pool of threads. 
When it's done, it gets returned to the pool, and then you can obtain an, a new thread to do your actual work, which is this I am render voxel space slice function, right? So that's something that I would do just to kind of uh, avoid the, the penalty of creating threads, every creating like seven threads every frame, um, and then waiting for them to join and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so each thread gets dispatched to this I'm render voxel space slice, which I'm assuming is the actual voxel rendering code. We'll take a look at that in a minute. And then we have sprite draw with the image data. So I actually want to see what this does, um, which uh, let's see, program.c, uh, core sprite draw and sprite does it. There's a lot of these sprite draw. Okay, so put pixel. So this stuff will actually uh, like blit the pixel into place into a, a target buffer, I guess. Um, but where is it going to put it? What, what, where is this function? That might be part of like some other library or something. I mean, like, oh no, image data. Image data, let's see, here we go. No, here it is. Right, this dot data dot position. Okay, so it puts it into image data. So we're just copying into image data. Again, each thread would have its own region that it copies into. So they're not really uh, overlapping or there's nothing uh, bad, I guess, going on there. And then I'm assuming once you have that, how are you getting that texture on screen? So let's see. So sprite draw just does that. Um, and then print f graphic swap buffers. What does that do? Aha, uh -huh. okay. Well, yeah, misleading function name. I had a feeling it was in here because um, that's like the that's like the next thing, really. But you can see we bind the texture, texture subimage 2D, which gets that image data from the CPU to the GPU now. And then we just issue a, like, we draw um, like six uh, vertices here, which makes up a quad. Uh, you could make this just a single triangle or something like that. But um, it just simply does like a quad. Uh, and then that fragment shader, I think that we very briefly saw just basically samples from that texture and then draws the pixels onto the screen. So that's kind of how the rendering side of it works. Again, there is just an image data that gets uploaded to the GPU every frame, and that's what we're kind of doing. It'd be kind of interesting to move this into a compute shader or into like a fragment shader. Um, that would be a cool little exercise as well. But that being said, we've come to the moment of truth where we actually take a look at this voxel kind of algorithm. So let's take a look at this and maybe we can actually visualize um, in some way how the algorithm is working because I think that'll be cool. So render voxel space slice. So we take in a bunch of parameters. Those were those kind of pthread info parameters that we take in here. Not sure why you had to make it a void pointer considering you obviously know the type, um, but sure. Uh, we have angle, just a bunch of other things, sine, cosine, uh, whatever. Um, we go through all this to determine the max height, I guess. I am clear, which probably clears the image data. And then while Z, okay, so we render it in depth slices and then we go through um, all the image data. Again, I'm not really familiar with this algorithm. I'm not going to dwell on it too much. I'm just looking at the actual code. Uh, and then we go through... Uh, X. Okay, so right, so we're going through horizontally, but then we're drawing vertical lines into the buffer. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about with the whole CPU cache situation. Um, we're kind of going through max height and we're putting start.y to i. So this loop that actually draws the pixels is going like, it's very possible that, I mean, to be fair, like the, the image size isn't very big because it looks so low resolution, but it could be like a, a cache miss every time you go down that row because obviously the memory that you're drawing to is far apart. It's not close together like it would be if you were, you know, doing start x equals i. So that's just something to kind of think about um, in terms of uh, like how your memory is laid out and how you're rendering to it. Uh, but okay, and then we basically draw vertical lines, um, which draw some kind of, yeah, vertical line. So that could also be difficult to do if you switch it to horizontal. I'm not sure how you would do that. But um, that seems to be uh, what you're doing here. And then that's the position, color maps, map index. OK, so we get like the position from the map. Where's the, there's probably like a height sample that we do here, height map color from height maps. Again, I'm trying to be very brief here. Um, and then we draw a vertical line based on uh, like the color that we've read in. And then I guess the distance is also going to be height on screen, which comes from the height map but then also probably to do with how far away it is, which is the Z value. 
Yeah, so height on screen you can see gets divided by z times like the scale which we played with again during runtime. So stuff that's further away obviously is smaller and closer to the center of the screen, which is our vanishing point. So yeah, pretty pretty cool. Um, again, really interesting to see the fact that I guess this does in fact uh, get dispatched on multiple threads and we're actually operating on separate regions of this image. The actual code is identical for each region. It's just the coordinates are offset. And so it's kind of easy to multi-thread. This is how like ray tracers and offline renderers like to do things as well. They have these tiles on the screen and then like each CPU core or even better, each like GPU processing unit as well, uh, if you're rendering on the GPU instead of the CPU can actually be dispatched to handle like a particular region of the image and do the calculations for them. That's also how just normal hardware accelerated rendering works. So we have like groups of pixels in the fragment shader that get processed at the same time because they're all kind of independent of each other. Uh, and that's like a huge optimization to having to kind of do it in a serial fashion where you go through every like pixel one by one. That's like a disaster. Um, because again, the pixels aren't really dependent on each other. So it's really easy to kind of, uh, I guess, multi-thread this. So you could you could definitely like seven threads is, is fine. Um, again, CPUs aren't really massive parallel machines. So I think that it would be really cool for you to take this project and move it to the GPU because that would be really cool. And that would just be way, way, way better performing. So that's kind of my little challenge for you. But anyway, let's see if we can visualize the rendering because that would be, I think it would be cool to actually see the threads being drawn. So for that to happen, we'll have to slow down the rendering. So let's see what we can do with the main loop. So my idea is just to basically have like a max iteration that we can draw to. So if I do like, um, let's do this. Uh, but then we can't really synchronize it between threads very easily, can we? Or maybe we can. So let's just make like a static int s max iteration. So I'm going to be a little bit loose with my synchronization because I don't really care about like this isn't this is just to test things. Um, but if we make that, what I'm going to do is basically tell it. Oh, no, 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 I don't have to. OK, this is what I'll do. So I've got my. So what this variable is going to be max iteration is as as many pixels or as it's not going to be directly pixels, but as many iterations of the rendering that we're allowing. Right. So in other words, like we can tell it, hey, I only want you to draw five lines this frame and then next frame it'll be six lines and then seven frames. Sorry, seven lines. So we'll actually kind of see the image being created over time. Um, and so to do that, uh, what I'll do is let's just do it here for now. All I'm going to do is I want to say if uh, and we're going to be only reading this variable here, so it's going to be fine across threads. If um, iteration, which we'll keep track of up here, iteration equals zero. If iteration uh, is like if, if iteration uh, is greater than max iteration, then we're going to break. Right. Uh, and then we'll also increment iteration. So we have a max iteration, which we will just basically increment every frame and then we'll uh, prevent it from doing any further rendering if it gets to the point of like our max desired iteration. So over here, after we join all the threads, I'm going to increment max iteration. This might be too slow, might be too fast. I'm not sure. We might have to add like a little thread sleep as well, which we could do to slow it down. But let's go ahead and I'll do make and uh, bin slash main dot bin. And let's see if we can visualize the kind of threads doing their rendering. Okay. Okay, cool. So that was very, very fast. <laughs> um, but you kind of saw how it was being drawn from the front to the back. Uh, and that's obviously thanks to the fact that this while loop goes from Z, which is like one all the way off into the distance. But let's also add like a little thread sleep. So I think it's like, I think we can use like U sleep, which is in microseconds. So let's sleep for like 10 milliseconds uh, and see if that kind of slows us down a little bit. OK. Yeah, so you can see that there, it still kind of looks like it's OK. We really need to separate the threads, I think. And we can do that by um, by telling it to uh, draw to show how it's actually doing the uh, actual pixel rendering. So I'll move this into here as well. Uh, and then this is probably going to be very slow now because it's going to break. It's going to break a whole lot easier. Um, so maybe we'll reduce the sleeping. Let's see if we can get rid of the sleeping entirely. Okay, cool. So we had to wait a while, but here it is. And you can see how 
those vertical lines are all being drawn kind of from left to right, but then they're actually ending at a certain point, right? Like we're drawing left to right, but then it stops and they're all also happening kind of at the same time, which is pretty cool. If we wait a little bit longer, we can see more of it being drawn and you can see how, you can kind of see how the screen's divided into these seven regions. And then we're kind of going through and drawing these vertical lines, which might not be very deep, I guess, but some of them are a little bit higher than others. So that's pretty cool. I love visualizing algorithms like this and seeing like how they actually work um, and like what order they do things in. Uh, it's I think it's really kind of educational and it's also just fun to look at. So yeah, pretty cool little project. I definitely enjoy this code review. You can also take a look at this if you like, because I've, I've left a link in the description below to this repository. Hope you guys enjoyed this little code review. Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. As always for this series, you can send in your code to churnareview at gmail.com. There'll be a, not a link, but like the email address will be in the description along with instructions of what you need to do if you wanna send in your code for me to take a look at. But otherwise, hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to hit the like button if you did and check out Skillshare using the link in the description below as well. See you guys later, goodbye.